as many of you know, my one of my uh, normal soapboxes is uh, telling people about eastern mineral and mining areas. And uh, today I'm pleased to talk about an area of Virginia that that few people up here in the northern part of the state where I live even know about. But we're going to be going right where this big heart is. This is down in the southwestern corner of Virginia, uh, quite a ways below Roanoke and Virginia Tech. And we're going to be looking at the New River Trail. And this is a terrific uh, way to see some of Virginia's amazing mining history. So let me go to the next one here. Um, let's see, is there a way that I can make these? Uh, I'm still seeing everybody on the left hand, right hand side. Uh, I guess we're okay. Um, the new uh, if you if you do view. You see view up in the upper right hand corner? Yes, I can. Okay. Click okay. on that and see what happens. Okay. Okay. Um, let me give you a few facts about the New River Trail. First of all, it's a 57 mile long rail trail and it was the old Norfolk and Western Railroad grade. Say again. It's the old Norfolk and Western Railroad grade that served uh, what they called the Cripple Creek Branch. And this was a branch line that ran from approximately uh, Pul where Pulaski, Virginia is now, uh, all the way down to Galax. And, and those of you that follow country music know that Galax is one of these places that has a, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of country music festivals going on. Um, it's really a scenic resource. Uh, it's uh, in an area that is not all that well developed for tourism, but there's plenty to do along the trail, hiking and biking and horseback riding. And they tell me that they cross country ski on it in the wintertime. But most of all, it's really a way to uh, see a lot of amazing uh, mining history in Virginia. And uh, I'm going to uh, try to show you just a few things today. Oops, wrong one. Hang on. Oop. There we go. We're going to we're going to visit six places that are along the trail. Uh, we're going to see the Hoover Iron Pigment Mines, a couple of iron furnaces, a shot tower, and the zinc mines at Bertha and the zinc mines at Austinville. And some of these we, we've touched on previously in different presentations, but uh, uh, I think you'll see some things that are interesting. So let's first uh, go to the Hoover Color Corporation. This is a an iron pigment mine, and it's closed now, and I think the company has been sold to the Chinese. But if you remember all those brown Crayola crayons, the burnt sienna ones and, and all the other tan and brown colors, this is where the pigments came from. And it has been converted uh, by the state, Virginia State Abandoned Mine Land Program into a mountain bike park. So here you can see the aerial view. You can see some of the trails. There's a lot more of them. And I want to zoom in on this one little area over here. Uh, it doesn't look like much, but these are not boulders sticking up. These are pinnacles of limestone bedrock. And the, the, uh, the pigment, the iron pigments were mined at the base of this, uh, these, these uh, pinnacles. And we'll see that that's a pattern for many of these old mining areas in, uh, in this part of the state. Uh, I have to admit, I didn't ride a mountain bike all over this place, but uh, I did give it a good tour, and uh, it's quite a uh, quite a unique little spot. Uh, and here along the river, this is the New River, you can see the highway and the trail runs right along it in this part of the, the, uh, um, the New River Trail. In a few places we're going to talk about, we jump off the trail a little bit, but uh, you have to do that to see some of the areas that are... Uh, difficult to access except by the trail itself so uh or the or a state highway that runs kind of parallel to it so here's the next thing we see this is this is called the boom iron furnace now there was once a thriving iron mining and smelting industry in the new river valley this is that whole southwestern corner of uh, of the state there are literally dozens of iron furnaces and the boom furnace, which you can see part of here, because some of the uh, some of the, the the stack of the furnace, I'm sure, has been hauled off by 
locals to use as foundation stones and things. But you can still see several of the openings of the furnace, and you can see the, the refractory brick lining here. Today, it sits on the property of a winery. So the Ironheart Winery, you can see some of the uh, some of the grapevines here. But when you look at it, you don't see any, any sense of mining. So where did the iron ore come from? Well, here's, here's the secret to exploring mining areas in the middle Atlantic states. You got to use LIDAR because we have such, such lush vegetation that literally the iron mines themselves are all naturally reclaimed. So they're all up in the northern part here of this picture. The boom furnace is down over here. But when you look at a LIDAR picture, immediately you see where all the pits were for the iron mines. And uh, this was uh, is, a, is a, a good example of, you know, the value of using LIDAR. And I'm going to show you a few other images that really have helped me as we explore some of these, some of these areas. So that's the boom iron furnace. Now let's move a little further down the trail and we get to the site of the Bertha iron mines. Now Bertha is a, an interesting spot. I talked a little bit about this at Birmingham. It was this, the mines were, the deposits were discovered in 1866 by a portrait artist and sort of amateur geologist, David Forney. And uh, here in this cross section from a, an excellent paper from about the 1900s, um, you can see again, this idea of pinnacles of limestone and dolomite with, or the speckled pattern shows where the, uh, in this case, zinc, zinc carbonate or uh, hydromor uh, calamine or hydromorphite, uh, hemomorphite uh, was mined. So they did it two ways. They did it by surface mining and underground mining. And this is kind of an exaggerated cross-section from a, uh, an excellent paper on the mining methods. It shows in the shallow part of the, uh, of the deposit, they could just remove the clay and then they'd be able to just harvest this, uh, this ore from between the pinnacles. But when the overburden got too thick or difficult to handle, uh, they sunk shafts. I'm sure they did this by, uh, by uh, not very scientific methods, but if they, if they were lucky, they got between a pinnacle and uh, where there was, was a good accumulation of ore. And then they mined it by going underground. And here's a, here's a picture of what the, oops, let's go back here. Here's a picture of what the, uh, the surface mining looked like. Um, they used timber line shafts and uh, very small things, maybe, maybe three foot square. And they also used some iron cylinders to go down uh, to uh, get between these pinnacles. And then they had hoists, which in some cases were shared among multiple shafts. And you can see all this timber laying here. This is for shoring up the uh, the mining area underground. You can also see a, a narrow gauge rail track here. And that's going to be used for hauling the ore to a uh, to a loading out area. And we'll see that in a minute. Hey, Mike. Yep. It is, is this, are these pinnacles the result of pinnacle first or were they uh, um, ocean pinnacles? Uh, no, no they, were, they were actually uh, decomposition of the uh, dolomite. And it mostly, most of the ore is in the dolomite, not the limestone. Uh, and so they've kind of dissolved and, and concentrated uh, the zinc minerals, which were probably sulfides originally, up in the, uh, in the higher levels of the dolomite. And then they, uh, as they decompose the limestone, then you got the um, got the hemomorphite or the calamine. Gotcha. gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. Good question. Um, here's just a cross section uh, again out of this paper by by a case in uh, 19, uh, 90, 1894, and it shows how they were how they were mining this stuff up in, be, in between these pinnacles. And also, if you look down at the bird's eye view, you see the pinnacles are in a very random pattern. And you really, uh, you really can uh, get a feeling for uh, how difficult that must have been. I will say the good old Virginia clay is almost like concrete in the summertime in my backyard. So uh, uh, they probably didn't have too many cave-ins. But what really attracted me to this whole Bertha story is I, in, in reading this, this one particular paper about it, uh, the, it had an amazing, innovative 
haulage system to get the ore, which was from about 300 foot up on the hill, up on top of the bluff over the river. The river is just right down here at the, the very bottom of the screen. And they built a washing plant or a concentrator, and they built an incline that uh, ran, ran up to where the uh, they had a dumping point at the top of the hill. And, uh, and the incline had three parts to it. It had a center rail system, which was mainly used for transporting supplies, both up to the mining area from the railroad, which was running right, right along here at the bottom. You can see the the horizontal uh, in indication of the railroad. And also it had on either side of the uh, of the railroad track, they had a flume. One flume was used for zinc ore. So they take this muddy, gummy looking uh, ore from the mine, they dump it with water into these flumes and the flumes would do part of the washing process as it the, the ore tumbled down and finally ended up at, at the milling area here. So this was, was, I thought, pretty ingenious. And they actually mined iron ore and could process iron ore in this plant as well. So they had two flumes, one on either side of the railroad track. And one was used for iron and ended up in the iron circuit. And another one ended up in the, uh, in the uh, circuit for the uh, zinc ore. So here's a couple pictures now of the little closer up. And I have to say all these photographs are from a photograph album that was prepared around 1893, I think. And it was at a time when the, the company was actually up for sale. But this is a view at the top of the, of the flume and the dumping point. You see the railroad track came in along the top here. They dumped into, into these flumes, which go down here. And then at the bottom of the hill, you can see the, the, tr the rail track and the flumes coming down, entering the top of the concentrator. And you can also see that the, uh, the railroad has several sidings here, both for ore and for shipping out concentrate to Pulaski and, uh, and then to allow regular rail traffic to continue. So this is an amazingly, amazingly interesting set of photographs. And, uh, and once, the, uh, once the ore got on the train, it, it headed about 30 miles away to Pulaski, Virginia. And I'll show you some pictures of that in a minute. But... I want you to see what, well, here immediately, this, this shows you again LIDAR. And LIDAR, these pits, these pits are intensely forested over, but you can see them jumping out. And in the parts, you can see these little, little bumps down here. This is some of the piles left by the underground mines. And then you can see the, the pinnacles sort of sticking up, even on the LIDAR, uh, from the, uh, the larger surface pits. And you can also see a track uh, part of this is a road, but it's also the same track that the narrow gauge railroad took to the dumping point above on the hill above where the flume went down to the, the ore dressing plant. And I want to zoom into this area here where it says Bertha Ore Dressing House, because on, on LIDAR, you can even see foundations. Now, when we went out to look, look at this site, I went out with, with the park superintendent. We had a heck of a time finding these things because there's such dense uh, undergrowth here. But sure enough, they were there. We mucked around a little bit and uh, and sure enough, foundations are still there. Everything else is gone. But if you get up halfway up where the, uh, uh, well, this, is, this shows the view at the top of the, of the top of where the uh, mining camp was and at the bottom where the concentrator had been. So you can see it's densely treed and we were there in March. So, uh, you know, the trees hadn't yet taken off and, and not too much of the normal summer undergrowth had started. But this, you can see right down the road here, this is the New River Trail. And there's a, a mile marker right about here. And just to the right of that mile marker, we can see um, where the incline came down. So we're standing about halfway up the incline. And, and if you uh, if you can get rid of these small scrubby bushes here, you can see the incline went down to the uh, to the washing house through this part, and then it went all the way up to the loadout point up at the top of the hill. So pretty interesting. Uh, the park people didn't know this stuff existed, so they were just delighted to find out a little more of their history of the of the park. Uh, this is a view, and I put this in because it's, you see a tail. You can see a tailings pond here. Long after the mines were shut down at Bertha, this this tailings pond and other tailings ponds were in the area were reprocessed at Austinville. But we'll come back to that one in a couple of minutes. So here's the uh, here's the smelter at 
Pulaski. You can see it has five furnaces and uh, and each one of them have two banks of retorts and uh, a bunch of railroad tracks hauling in the ore, hauling in coal. And uh, you see a bunch of uh, the, the smelter workers standing in front of one of the racks of retorts. And the key thing about Bertha zinc was that it was the purest zinc being made in the world. Uh, the Bertha Zinc Company uh, produced 99.9 plus 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 uh, percent uh, zinc. And later on, when New Jersey Zinc acquired the, the Bertha Zinc Company, or the Bertha Mineral Company, as it was later called, uh, they primarily did it probably to get the... Uh, the copyrights and the and the trademarks for the Bertha Zinc, uh, because they'd actually shut down uh, most of the, the uh, Bertha facilities uh, in the late 1890s. So let's go to just one other thing, and this is just go quickly here. This obviously you need coal for uh, smelting, and so further west into the mountains, there's a whole coal area of semi-anthracite coal that was initially used in the furnaces and the retorts down at uh, Pulaski. And later they switched to a higher quality coal once the Pocahontas coal field uh, was opened up with another branch railroad line. And so Pocahontas is a, a very famous uh, area um, and they have a great mining museum there. And uh, and this just has a couple pictures of what it was like back in the in the hinterlands. And it is still just as wild as this where these coal mines were located. You can see a tipple coming out and you can see the on the upper map here, you can see this little narrow gauge railroad that they ran up to the coal mines. And the locals all love this, this little engine down here. This was a, um, a great little steam engine and they all called it Cynthia. The miners commuted to work on Cynthia and then they hauled coal car, cars full of coal down uh during the mining shifts and uh, just one other thing i got to show you on lidar again here here you can see the outcrop of the coal seam and all the entries that are still up there covered in all kind of undergrowth but they're still there and this is a hard place to get to believe me <laughs> Okay, let's go down the trail a little bit from the Bertha smell, the Bertha mines, and we get to the Fall, Foster Falls Ironworks, and you can see this is a little better preserved iron furnace here. Uh, it's this whole area right down here in the uh, in the right hand side of the picture where the furnace is is the headquarters of the New River Trail Park. And so they've got a visitor center. They've got a, a lot of different recreational activities. There's boating and there's fishing and, and everything else. But we were mostly interested in this, in this, uh, in this furnace. And uh, but what, to our surprise, just uh, a year ago, they rehabbed what had been an, at different times an old hotel, a school, an orphanage. And now it's going to be a B&B &B for park visitors. So that's, a, that's another reason to go down and check out Foster Falls. So the mine was over here across the river. And, uh, and they actually had a, a, one of these little dinky engine railroads going across with a, there's still a pier sort of sitting in the river here and uh, uh, taking the ore over to the iron furnace. And again, here's the, uh, here's the, here's the mines. There's another little mine here. Here's the iron furnace. And um, this 1990 map, 1890 map rather, shows, again, this, this narrow gauge system, shows the furnace. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, the railroad bridge for the, for the little dinky engine was totally destroyed in 1916 when it had the huge flood in the New River. It affected every, practically everything along it. You can still see the the pier for the uh, for the bridge, but everything else is gone. And that, of course, was the end of the iron ironing iron furnaces there. Uh, this picture here it shows you how much of of the foundations of the blowing engine and uh, and the other steam powered facilities were here. This, this is a pretty well preserved iron furnace, as Virginia goes. We have a lot of them. So let's get back along the trail again, and we go uh, a couple more miles, and we get to the Jackson Shot Tower. 
And this is a Virginia State Historical Park. And those of you that uh, went to Dubuque, Iowa, when we had the uh, the Galena Conference, you're familiar with shot towers and how they work. The, the, the lead is melted. The lead is melted at the top of the shot tower. It falls down by gravity, forms little spheres, and dumps into a pot of water at the bottom of the shaft in this case. This is kind of unique in that it's a half tower, half shaft kind of operation. And then they had a little tunnel that took it out and you could get it onto in the early days, um, like the eight, early 1800s, this would have been met by uh, ox carts or or wagons. And they shipped this, this, uh, this lead shop all over the middle Atlantic. Um, so this is a really nicely restored facility. And if you stand on this fence here, you got a terrific view of the uh, of the New River. And also you can see over to one of the uh, Jackson family's homes, which is on the other side of the river. So the other big story here in this presentation is that of the Austinville lead and zinc mines. Now, Austin, we're coming down the trail and the, you kind of come out of this tunnel and all of a sudden, bingo, you're at Austinville. And this is the trailhead at Austinville. You can see the uh, trail trundling on down here. Uh, there's also a state highway right here, so it has easy trail access. Well, this was probably the longest operating metal mines in the United States. Uh, they produced lead at Austinville for George Washington's Revolutionary War Army. And it was the main source of lead for the Confederacy during the Civil War. And it actually continued to operate into the 1980s. So let's see a few pictures here and see what we can uh, find. First of all, it's a little hard sometimes to get the lay of the land here at Austinville because there's a lot of things happening. You can see the New River Trail is running right along the bottom of this bluff. I don't know whether my, uh, my cursor is showing. And there's a, a big floodplain down here. And there were, were at different times a lot of facilities here. The trailhead we're standing at is right here. And on the top of the hill, you can see some of the old pits that are pre-Civil War and Civil War era surface mines that were used to produce the lead. And again, these were that whole story of pinnacles and uh, and in the case of lead, uh, the, the Galena falling down in, uh, between the pinnacles. Uh, you can see the modern developments here. These are all post-1920. Uh, they're all largely New Jersey zinc, and we'll, we'll tell that story in a minute. But uh, this, this operation is still in business, but it's not producing lead and zinc. It's producing agricultural lime from this, from this pit area over here. I'm going to mention one other thing. You see here a thing called Chiswell's Hole. This is the discovery site of Austinville. And I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Anyway, this is this is kind of the lay of the land. And again, there's about a 100 foot or more uh, elevation difference between the top of the hill here and the bottom of the hill where the railroad grade is and, and the, where the trail is. And I'm just going to show you. Obviously, with LIDAR, the, the surface mines pop right out. Now, a little bit of the timeline of, uh, of Austinville. Um, it was discovered by a, a Tory uh, who was pretty notorious uh, back in 1750, in, in 1758 or 56, rather. I can't quite see that because there's a thing on my screen. But uh, anyway, it, that's where they produced the lead for the uh, Revolutionary War. And supposedly Chiswell was out here, and this was really the frontier in the, in the mid to late 1700s. And he was afraid of getting attacked by Indians. So he holed up in a cave and the cave was called Chiswell's Hole. And it's right down just about at the, at the edge of the river. I haven't ever really hiked down to this, but I just recently saw a picture of, taken from Chis, of Chiswell's Hole uh, on Facebook. So I added this in here, but it's right down on the, on the edge of the new river. Um, after the Revolutionary War, a number of people operated mines. Uh, and in, eight, in 1780, Moses Austin arrived, and from 1780 to 1800, he produced uh, lead from the, uh, from the uh, Austinville mines. In, eight, in 1800, he decamped down to Missouri, 
And while he was in Austinville, Stephen Austin, the father of Texas, was born, and the town Austinville bears his name today. After Moses Austin left, the, the landowners decided they'd go into the, uh, into the mining business, and a number of them who had land positions operated their own mines. They were very inefficient. Uh, there was probably some slave labor use, but there were also, um, in, in actual mining, they actually had a lot of English miners. Um, then they finally figured out that it was better to work collectively rather than individually. And so in 1838, they formed the With Lead Mines Company. And With is the county name, it's With County. And With was a colonial era politician in, uh, in Virginia. So there's a lot of With things in Virginia. And so they ran that company for 10 years. And then they had an agreement that they would constitute a new company in 1848. And they did that, but there was some hate and discontent going among with one, with one of the uh, one of the owners, and he didn't really come around until 1855. And the uh, they formed yet another company, the Union Lead Mines Company. And then, of course, in 1861, the Civil War broke out, and so lead <clears throat> at Austinville was continued to be mined, but it was all sold to the Confederate government through the Niter and Mining Bureau. And the lead works were attacked twice, pretty late in the, in the war, and the buildings were burned and destroyed, but actually because most of the surface buildings were frame and they were mining by surface methods, uh, production in each time was resumed pretty quickly. And the reason we know about the, all this little part of the timeline from 1840s and 50s and 60s is because of this fellow down here, William Kohler, was a German mining engineer, and he was the mine manager leading up to the Civil War and during the Civil War. Right after the Civil War, he went back to Germany. He finally died in Germany around in the 1890s. But he left a detailed report that literally showed all the fractional ownership shares of anybody who was a descendant of all these original four landowners. So he's he's left a very valuable historical document. Now let's take a look at a couple of pictures. This is a New Jersey zinc map. It's from the Virginia Energy Collection, uh, which was donated by the Austinville Limestone Company, the Ag Lime people. And this is a, a map that really shows you these original surface mines from the pre-Civil War era. Some very, very big and quite deep uh, surface mines. And the thing I wanted to point out is in the uh, in the 40s and 50, and, and, and I guess around 1851, they finally went into production with a shot shaft. So here's another shot tower type thing, or like an inverted shot tower, that literally just drops the molten lead down a shaft, a mine shaft. And they had a uh, an adit that was run following this dark line. And that came out to where the New River Trail is today. Because this is a, a New Jersey zinc map, and they didn't really start being interested down there until 1900 or more, uh, these are some later buildings that are shown here. We'll talk about a couple of these in a minute. Anyway, the trailhead is right here where it says station. And, uh, and so we're going to see a couple of views from the station. And as we go down, we're going to see a picture of this milling operation here. And so let's go to the next slide. Here's the trailhead, and here's the little kiosk that is located where the Austinville Railroad Station was. There's a lot of parking here. It's a good access point for the uh, for the New River Trail. And if you look from the trailhead down to the left, you can see this white building in the trees. And there's actually two buildings there. This building here, which was a, at one time a mining office, and it had was on the site of what had originally been two company stores when when the individual landowners were operating mines. And then if you go and look over here into the right hand side, you can just make out some some flagpoles, and that's where the Moses and Stephen Austin mon monument is located. And here you got the uh, the Stephen Austin part of it. Of course, Stephen was a young lad when they when they left uh, Austinville. He was born in Austinville. But of course, he became the famous father of Texas. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of recognition of the Austins 
actually, I think they stiffed a lot of their creditors and the and the state uh, people who had leased them the property. But uh, they moved on anyway to Missouri and then began lead mining in the state of Missouri. So after the Civil War, yet another company was formed, the, the With Lead and Zinc Company. And pretty much all the lead reserves were depleted during the war. And zinc was recognized. They actually, the Confederate government shipped some uh, zinc ore to a smelter in Petersburg, Virginia. But we know that Richard Pasco, our, our friend uh, from Freedensville, Pennsylvania and, and Silver Hill, North Carolina, we know Richard was there for a period of time working for the uh, Confederate uh, uh, Niter Mining Bureau. And he certainly would have recognized the potential of the zinc ore. So we don't know whether he went back after the war and told the northern uh, capitalists about it. But uh, anyway, the word got out. Uh, the waste material uh, from Bertha and, and waste material that had been left on the ground at Austinville, uh, these were all reprocessed during this uh, post-Civil War period because they hadn't yet they hadn't yet implemented anything with flotation. So they had a big problem dealing with the, with the zinc sulfides and, and the small amount of lead sulfides that they encountered. Well, if you jump ahead, 1902, New Jersey Zinc acquires the With Lead Zinc Company. This was one of the last things they did in, as part of the great zinc consolidation where New Jersey Zinc basically tried to establish a zinc cartel. And uh, and yet they didn't really do much with the property. It was still limited production. Again, much like this uh, reprocessing of tailings, they brought ore in from uh, Tennessee. They brought ore in from uh, Arkansas, as far as away as Arkansas. But it wasn't until uh, 1916 when this devastating flood, the same one that took the bridge out at, at Foster Falls, it took out a lot of the infrastructure on the lower floodplain where there was a lot of employee housing and some early processing facilities. So by 1920, New Jersey Zinc decided they were going to do a renewal of the district. And they put a lot of money into uh, building a new mill, sinking a uh, over 1,000 foot mine shaft, the Van Matter shaft, uh, building a whole new company town, this time on top of the hill. So it was away from the flood area. And this all happened in the 20s and 30s. And then one last big improvement in Austinville occurred in 1958. And we'll see a couple of pictures of that in a minute. But of course, in 1966, Gulf and Western bought New Jersey Zinc. And with the depressed prices and the low grade ores at Austinville, the mine was finally shut down in 1981. So by roughly by my calculations, that's 225 years worth of production. So let's take a look at what you see from the trail. We're standing on the trail looking through these, these bushes, and we see a building there. Well, thanks to our friends at the New River Trail, we were able to get down below the trail. And this is a carpenter shop building. It's the last New Jersey zinc building down here on the, the floodplain area. And uh, it's, it's totally empty of any, any equipment, but it's, it's hanging in pretty well for a frame building. And then just behind it, over here to the left of this building, you can see the sealed attic from the shot shaft and the where they bring the uh, the the shot from the uh, the mine shaft where they drop the molten lead down and they bring it out to the uh, to this this portal on the shaft. So this was a pretty interesting development again from the 1850s. Now, if you go further down the trail, here we are. We're getting close to a mile post 29 and and in this area we see a whole lot of foundations up on the hillside here and this is what new jersey zinc called the old mill and this is the mill that operated after the civil war and had a lot of other infrastructure down here on the on the floodplain um i'll mention that this floodplain has has been fenced off because the soil by epa standards is considered contaminated but it's this is an, what they call an institutional barrier to getting people onto this, this grassy area. But you can walk around there and you can even climb the fence like we did and, and took a picture of the, uh, of the shot shaft tunnel. Um, 
here's another picture. These are from the 20s. This shows the Van Matter shaft. This was the main hoisting shaft for all the mines at Austinville once New Jersey's ink really kicked into high production. And this is their mill with the head frame in the background. And this was a flotation mill. So they were able to deal effectively with the uh, with the, the lead and the zinc sulfides that were in the ore. And this is the mill that operated up until 1981. Parts of this mill are still being used by the Agaline people. I haven't been in the mill lately, but uh, I'm sure they've added some new equipment, but uh, it was a pretty, it's a pretty impressive structure. And the, and the technology that they use was developed at the New Jersey Zinc Smelter and Laboratory in Palmerton, Pennsylvania. And then it was transplanted down here into the mill in the in the 20s. Up on the top of the hill, here's the, the, the modern town of Austinville. And you can see Austinville had some employee housing here on this kind of fishbone pattern. They had three or four streets here. And like a lot of company towns from that era, you had management housing over here, which was a little higher up on the, on the quality standard. But this is still a very well-maintained little town, uh, even though the people have to go quite a ways into Withville and, uh, and other towns to find work now. You see over here the school. It was an elementary school with a multi-purpose room that was a community center. And this little uh, Baptist church here is still there and it's still active in the community. And if you go to Austinville, you're going to you're going to come down the street and you're going to go down the hill to the floodplain down here. <clears throat> Let's go to see one more picture. Here is a picture that was from the 30s while they were still doing all this development. They still had the old structures down here on the floodplain, some of the old housing. This was the old mill in the distance. You can see a zinc oxide plant here. You can see the tall stack and the, and the zinc smelter. And uh, you can see off in the distance here, this giant white pile. This is agricultural lime, which New Jersey zinc also sold as an important product. Uh, and that's exactly what the current mining company is doing at Austinville. So let's, uh, let's go one a little more distant down, maybe another thousand feet down the trail. And what do we find? We find the concentrate bins that are left over from the smelting days. And if you get to the edge of the, the fence by the trail, have maybe a pair of binoculars, you can look over here and you'll see the Jackson Family Cemetery. These are from the original Jackson family that built the shot tower. And it's pretty hard to see them once all the vegetation grows up, but they're out there and they're a little bit sort of showing the, the worst for wear, but uh, uh, it's probably had a little vandalism, but it's it's kind of an important historical feature at Austinville. Now, I want to, when you bring you up to sort of the, the end of Austinville's history, uh, in, uh, in the 1950s, New Jersey Zinc was seriously looking for other ore bodies, and they had an ore body over here to the left-hand side un, across the river at a, at a little town called Ivanhoe. And so they sunk a shaft at Ivanhoe, and they drove a tunnel from the Van Matter shaft over here, 13,000 feet under the river, and connected up to the Ivanhoe ore body. And they hauled all that Ivanhoe ore over here to the to the concentrator at uh, in Austinville. They also had some smaller bodies out here on the eastern side of the uh, of the property. They sunk a thing called the Flatwood Shaft here. I don't think there was too much production coming from there. But um, uh, if you if you all remember Keith Ross's uh, presentation on, uh, and I think it was March of two years ago, he showed. The, the whole network of underground workings here at Austinville as a model made from the New Jersey zinc maps that are part of this New Jersey zinc collection down here at Virginia Energy. And uh, so this was really intensely mined. It was also incredibly sampled with the most, some of the most detailed sampling I've ever seen because they had low grade ore here and they were very concerned about not mining much that was waste so, and it's kind of a very irregular ore body, as you can see here. So that was kind of the last big infrastructure improvement at Austinville. And they got about uh, 30 years out of it because uh, 
the mine uh, finally uh, closed down in the in the in the eighties, and this is a uh, Bostonville uh, again, probably from the uh, the late thirties when there was still some of this infrastructure down here on the floodplain, the big the big pile of uh, ag lime, and you can see a little bigger view of the uh, of the housing development. There's a bridge across here today, and uh, that makes access to uh, Austinville a little easier for people. Um, this is out of a series of historic pictures along the New River uh, that are in the West Virginia University uh, Regional History Center. So I want to I want to acknowledge some some folks who who really helped me on uh, on trying to do uh, this research on uh, particularly on Austinville. John Park, who many of you know, uh, has been a long student of uh, of zinc mining in many places in the country, and he has a wonderful collection of the New Jersey Zinc Company magazine, and he loaned me that, and that's where some of those pictures that you saw in the presentation. Uh, there are a lot of AIME transactions and SME uh, papers on New Jersey zinc properties and a few really good ones on Austinville and one terrific one on Bertha. Uh, the map collection at, uh, at Virginia Energy or the old Division of Mines, Minerals and Energy in Charlottesville was donated by Austinville Limestone, the Ag Lime Company. These were, were totally left behind in a, in a in a mine office building. And so a few years ago, uh, using some money from a USGS grant, uh, the Virginia Energy folks got permission from Austinville Limestone people, and they hauled the, uh, the a good portion of the collection up to Charlottesville, and they photographed it. And this is all available online now. It's a terrific uh, set of maps. All the level maps, these are the maps that uh, Keith Russ used to uh, model the uh, the uh, Austinville mine. And I just want to say one other thing here. I, I can't say enough about the New River Trail park staff. Uh, Sam Sweeney, the uh, park superintendent, spent a half a day with us out bushwhacking through the, the, the wilds of the trail to find the Bertha operations. And uh, we had a really wonderful day with him. And... Uh, and I think we helped him uh, understand a little bit about some of the, the mining history on his trail. Um, the pictures that you saw, most of them from Bertha, are uh, from the Wythe County Historical Society. Again, a document was found there that they didn't even know they had. So uh, we were very, very fortunate. And of course, a lot of other sources. And that's sort of the end of the, the trail for us, but the trail continues on about another 30 miles or so and ends up in Galax, Virginia, uh, where you can feast on uh, country music. Uh, I guess I have one other thing I'm going to show you here because this is, oops, let's go back to this. Um, you know, we talked about all the iron furnaces. Well, Historically, from colonial times, uh, and using mo using mostly charcoal iron furnaces until really around the 1900s, uh, Virginia's cumulative iron ore production was about 26 million long tons and about 11 million long tons of pig iron. Um, basically, they continue producing during these peak years until the ore from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and the Mesabi Range started hitting the market. They just couldn't compete with that, and that shut down the entire Virginia ore production. Really, basically, after 1920, 1925, and there's been no production really since 1930. Uh, the pre the the Civil War era and and earlier production uh, of lead has been estimated to be about 272,000 short tons of lead. Uh, but pretty much lead production was was minimal once the zinc mining started. And they produced a lot of zinc between Bertha and Austinville. Uh, about at Austinville, particularly, they were producing about a half a million tons a year of ore, but it was very low grade, 3% and, and a tiny little bit of lead in it. And this is why ultimately they had to shut down the mine because you just could not at the 18 at the 1970s uh, zinc prices 1980s zinc prices you could not make a month and make a buck at zinc mining 
So that's the story of Virginia. Oop. Okay. Any questions? Sorry, this took a little longer, but you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is Johnny. I, I was fascinated. I've got some questions and comments. Yeah. Uh, some you just answered. I was going to say they looked like charcoal furnaces, and I guess they were. The, the cold quality was not that great and wasn't nearby. And so charcoal was the way to go. Um, probably about 10 years ago, I, I'd seen a shot tower before. It's right off I 77. But I took, was coming back from North Carolina, I had my bike with me. And so I parked at that Austinville access thing and rode my bike all the way down to Foster Falls where the park is, checking it out because I wanted I want to paddle it sometime. I was looking for a place to put in a takeout where I can do it with one vehicle and just hide a bike at the lower end and then put my canoe or kayaks in at the upper end and then paddle down and then ride the bike back the, the trail because that's a great way of going out of state and doing stuff with one vehicle without, when you're worried about the shuttle. But somewhere between the Shot Tower and Austinville, there's another added vent type opening that comes right after the trail there that I think it's really primitive looking. Um, you showed one that's somewhere that's all like bricked in and all, but it seems to me there was a real primitive one that was might have, I don't know if it's a drainage added or what, or vet, air vent or something. Somewhere yeah, it, there. If, if it's right after the tunnel, it's an air vent from the workings of the old, the uh, the modern Austinville mine. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah, I remember seeing that. But it's, it's a great place. I I, I want to get back there so bad. And like I said, I if you can do mining history and paddle and bike at the same time, I mean, that's just fantastic. Yeah, it's a it's a great asset to have the trail there. There's so much there's so much more about um, southwestern Virginia mining history because if you if you leave the trail and the, of a tributary to the New River is called the Cripple Creek, not like Colorado, but uh, it's uh, it goes by probably another dozen iron furnaces, and uh, and. I haven't explored that area too much. I've driven through it a couple of times and you can see several of them just from the road, but you got to use LIDAR to find out where the mines are because it's really intensely uh, forested. So Mike, great presentation. Um, is there any silver content that's at all appreciable in any of this lead ore? I don't think so at Austinville or Bertha. In fact, the, the lack of impurities is why Bertha was able to, to produce such pure zinc. They didn't have much, much if any, lead there at all. Whereas Austinville, which is maybe 15 miles away, um, had lots of lead, um, but it was it was zoned. As you went to the top, top of the ore body, you had lead, and as you got down to the bottom, you had zinc. Mike, can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, Damien. How are you doing? Good. Um, that was a terrific talk. The limestone spires you were talking about at the beginning. Yes. Are these dissolutional features? Is a sort of is the lead left behind as a result of dissolution? Yeah, it, the lead was definitely left behind, and uh, particularly at Austinville, the the solution surface is is quite variable but we believe that uh that when chiswell found the ore body to begin with back in 1856 or seven um he was he was just in a cave and he found pieces of uh this uh you know this kind of oxidized dolomite and and pieces of lead just laying around uh he definitely wasn't a prospector and uh but he definitely was an opportunist <laughs> I think there's a place near there called Fort Chiswell that's part of early Virginia history. It's named for him somewhere off I-81. I yes, it is. yeah, it is. Uh, they named it for him. It's it's near a, it's near where the interstate coming up from the south intersects I-81, and yeah. uh, and and there was a a house there for a long time. I'm not sure whether it's still there, but it uh, it was supposed. Oh, I, to be I haven't gotten into it. I. I yeah, I'm here, James. I'm it was, talking. It was called Fort Chiswell back. back in the day, and uh, oh, and I, there are, you I know, there. Was... I got into this when I got into this thing, and I found this document from uh, 
uh, William Kohler, uh, he had such detailed information of the mine ownership. Uh, several of these folks were uh, real entrepreneurs, the four basic families. Uh, one guy, a guy named William White, who was a Pennsylvanian who came down when it was still uh, very early days. Um, he, uh, he at one time was considered to be the wealthiest man in the United States because he had basically cornered the market on rock salt. And he did this from a little town below Austinville called Saltville. And he trundled this stuff down the, the Houston River all the way into the Tennessee Valley area. And he, uh, in the end, had plantation uh, houses and, and farms in uh, Tennessee and, and uh, Alabama and all those states in the Tennessee River Valley. And he was a, a real, uh, a real uh, amazing guy. Uh, another branch of the family of these people uh, produced uh, John Campbell Greenway of Arizona and Ajo mining fame. Uh, the Greenways were part of the descendants of these early families of, uh, of mine operators at Austinville. Um, there were two families that were heavily into uh, running these iron furnaces. So moving into zinc and lead was a natural thing for them. Uh, they were the Pierces and the Jacksons and, uh, and, uh, and others. So this is a, we've got about a, a multi, uh, maybe an eight, eight or nine generation family tree for all these people. And this is all based on the, the document that Will, William Kohler produced back in the, uh, in about 1867 after the Civil War. Kohler reminds me of Rott from Ducktown, you know, a German guy with no particular political loyalties running a mine before and during the Civil War for whoever was owned it. You know, I mean, that same thing at Ducktown. It was, you know, they kept it going and just uh, because uh, they had to, I guess, switch sides if you needed to. Well, I think the owners all decided that they uh, they were they were deep in the Confederate South of Virginia, and uh, they did they did the well, smart thing, which was they continued to run the mine themselves under Kohler's supervision, and for a while, about six months, Pasco Richard Pasco, who had been down at Silver Hill, kind of the backup lead supply for the Confederacy, he was up here, and uh, all the records from that era are. Uh, I think available on fold three by ancestry, but they're definitely down in the natural national archives here. Um, because you can see the pay stubs, you can see the production invoices and, uh, and it's quite an interesting collection of things from the time that the Niter and mining bureau was, was operating, okay. which is another whole story in itself, of course. <laughs> my, my last comment is seems to me, John Park and some of his New Jersey stuff, there's, pictures of Austinville um, that in the larger areas, I mean, it was sizable room and pillar type mining there and eventually filled with water, but kind of like the mines you saw in Missouri. In other words, it was large room and pillar where the deposit was big. And you just don't envision that from looking at the, at the maps. Yeah, actually there were only, there, there were several types of mining there. I think Johnny, uh, they had some that were more conventional kind of vertical slopes. And uh, and they had some that were definitely sort of like room and pillar or soap and pillar. Yeah, they had a lot of different mining methods underground. You can see this um, in the uh, in the mine maps that uh, are at the uh, Virginia Department of Energy. Yeah, really a terrific terrific resource. Man. Well, thank you all for uh, for listening to my tale of Eastern mining in Virginia. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mike.